Alberta, you're a lady. I guess songwriter Shannon Two Feathers had some kind of special inspiration when he wrote those words, because, Alberta, you are quite a lady. You're subject to the whims and the fancies and the changes of mood and attitude that is the right of every temperamental woman. And yet you maintain a beauty and kindness and gentleness that seems to belong to you alone, Alberta. So here am I to sit down and tell you folks a story about Alberta, my favorite province, the province of my birth, my childhood, my rearing, the province of my choice. A province so diverse and so bountiful, so kind to its inhabitants, and at the same time a province that can change and turn a harsher cheek. A province that has known so much history and looks forward to so much future. Where do you start to tell the story of Alberta? Well, if I had the long-range vision of one of our famous bighorn sheep, then I could lie on an alpine meadow and curl up comfortable and content in the shiny Alberta sun and look at our plains to the east just as far as my eyes could see. And that might be a good place to start telling the story from. Wait. No, better yet. Perhaps you should put yourself in that position so that you can see all of my province at once, and then I'll travel across it, stopping here and there, and I'll point out some of the highlights. In other words, I'll do the work, and you look to the horizons, south, east, and north, and maybe we can gain an appreciation of the diversity and splendor that is Alberta. I'm going to start down this river. I could pick from many, but I'm going to choose the red deer, because I think it outlines best the ages of our province before the white man's coming gave us a written chronicle of events. You see, along the cliffs of the Red Deer River, the erosion of wind and water has created a geological time chart that graphically illustrates the ages from the beginning of time. Dr. Wes Reed, who lived in and studied the formations of the Badlands for many years, provides us with this great description. A great gash eroded by the southeasterly flow of the Red Deer River. It seems to be another world as the valley shears through stratum after stratum of the Earth's history as through a gigantic layer cake. Up and down the valley stretch the Badlands, a panoramic wonderland of bizarre and complex ridges, pyramids, steep bluffs, massive buttes, steep-walled gorges and canyons. The terraced, multicolored walls are composed of layer upon layer of shale, sandstone, ironstone, bentonite, and clay. The Badlands colors range from black through brown and buff to gray and white and vary with every change in weather, hour, and season. The colors are soft and tinged with mauve after a summer shower, tinged with pink and gold at sunset, and rather flat and drab at high noon. The Badlands provide a show window through which it is possible to look into the heart of one of the world's most dramatic demonstrations of the great sedimentary land-building processes displayed in the colored bands of the formations. And the most dramatic of all was the age of the dinosaur. Now, dinosaur bones are still found in size and quantity and provide concrete evidence of highly specialized and bizarre giant lizards who lived in a huge delta of swamps and brackish water along the western border of the inland sea. There were literally hordes of dinosaurs. Some reached a weight of 10 tons. But not all were giants. Most were large, true enough, but some were no larger than a rooster. The spectacular dinosaur age came to an end in a tragic fashion for the giant lizards, though. With the coming of the Ice Age about a million years ago, huge ice caps formed in the Arctic regions and began to flow southward over North America. That was the end for the giant lizards. Alberta remained as an ice-free corridor until about 35,000 years ago. Finally, 
slow-moving sheets of ice up to 5,000 feet thick, advancing from the north and east, began to grind ponderously over Alberta. At the same time, another sheet of ice formed in the Rocky Mountain region. It flowed out to meld with the other, making Alberta a waste of ice. Pre-existing valleys, including that of this Red Deer River, had their irregular slopes smoothed by the passage of the ice. Now the last retreat of the ice began about 12,000 years ago and left enduring impressions on the landscape. Alberta, as we know her now, had finally been shaped. But let's stay with this river. This river has seen it all. There were millions of buffalo feeding in its lush valleys, massacres, Indian battles, trader skirmishes, prairie fires took place along her banks. The Indian, the trapper, the trader, the missionary, the gold miner, the settler, and the farmer have all navigated and used from the waters of this river. It has been host to millions of migratory birds every spring and fall since its time began. At any rate, we've reached a new chapter for our river and our province. The Indian and the buffalo now are the focus of our attention. The Indian's diet was meat. Every prairie brave was a skilled buffalo hunter. He could shoot a killing arrow from the bare back of his pony through the tough hide of a galloping bull. When necessary, a band of braves would stampede entire herds over steep cliffs to their death. Right along this river, there are many buffalo kills. The earliest of Western Canadian Indians hunted on foot and their wanderings, no doubt, were determined by the direction the buffalo took. But even the buffalo had a migratory pattern and over thousands of years, foot trails, which later became horse and travois trails, were scarred across the prairie. When the buffalo hunters finally made contact with more southern tribes, they became exposed for the first time to horses. It quickly became apparent that they would be more effective hunters when mounted, and the desirability of horses inspired many a stealthy raid on the neighboring tribe's herds of mustangs. By the time the first explorers reached western Canada, it is likely they encountered skilled Indian horsemen among every prairie tribe. It's likely, too, that the earliest white men and their colorful voyageurs were quick to follow the Indian trails, knowing they would always keep them in touch with food sources and water. Some of Alberta's famous trails still parallel or in fact follow on top of these early Indian trails. From your viewpoint, high on that alpine meadow, look now with your mind's eye to the plains below and you'll be able to imagine an age in which Indian and buffalo predominate Alberta's plains. Grant McEwen's picture of this relationship between Indian and buffalo bears quoting. The prairie Indian ate fresh buffalo meat as long as they could get it. And when they could not get it because the herds were far away, they ate pemmican, which they made from a mixture of dried buffalo meat and Saskatoon berries. From buffalo skins, they made articles of clothing, covers for teepees, and robes to serve as blankets for their beds. A stomach removed from the body of a dead buffalo could be used as a handy basket or container for carrying food and water. Buffalo bones could be fashioned into knives and other tools. It was not surprising that Indians occupying the prairie areas thought of these big animals as special gifts to them from the Great Spirit. What is now southern Alberta and southern Saskatchewan may have been the best of all buffalo country. The grass was short but nutritious, and it furnished good feed in winter as well as summer. It brought an advantage to the Blackfoot Indians living in that part, and they, knowing their good fortune and being so favorably located, fought savagely to protect their good hunting ground. It was at a time of migration that the animals came together to form the biggest herds, giving the impression that the plains were black with buffalo. A Northwest Mounted Police officer riding from Fort McLeod to Fort Capel told that for days he was never out of sight of buffalo. 
and Reverend John McDougall, the pioneer Methodist missionary, told of standing on Spy Hill on Calgary's north side and seeing buffalo herds on all sides. He believed he was seeing fully half a million of the big animals at that time. Well, now if you can look far enough north and east on a bigger river, you'll see the first white traders coming into our story. At this time, the fur trade was thriving farther east, and the demand for coveted beaver pelts brought adventurous explorers and fur traders farther west each year. Perhaps the largest fur bounty of all awaited in the valleys and the east slopes of the Rockies. At any rate, forts sprung up quickly along the shores of the many Alberta rivers and their tributaries, and the proud Plains Indians were soon to lose their domination of a land that had been theirs since their beginning. The years that follow now belong to the men of the rivers, fur traders, trappers, explorers, and the colorful voyageurs. They were in a class by themselves. The walls of the forts rang with their lusty commotion as they outfitted their canoes with trade goods in the spring, and again in the fall their crude York boats laden with pelts. Rowdy and fun-loving, their game was adventure and challenge of the unknown as they attacked work or leisure with equal zest. Trade was brisk. Every spring, the traders outfitted their canoes with flour, sugar, beads, tools, utensils, and liberal amounts of liquor, and traveled deep into Indian country, returning in late fall their trade canoes laden with prize fur pelts. They followed the explorers, who kept up a constant search for new and better trade routes, opening the regions as they went. With compass and journal, charts and maps, they traveled by foot and canoe, serving as public relations men to the Indians for the fur companies. Men like Hendy, Gaddy, Thompson, Fiddler, Pond, and Mackenzie played a significant role in the early development of the region which is now Alberta. As the years go by, even the mighty fur empire goes the way of all great reigns. What once seemed an inexhaustible supply of furs had quickly been depleted. And fashion no longer dictated fur hats to be worn. The silkworm has now become a predominant creature, and by the late 1860s, even major posts like Edmonton House have fallen deeply into debt. Fort Edmonton developed into a supply center for the Hudson's Bay trade, in particular that going north. And here, once again, it was the river that played a big part. You see, the North Saskatchewan River was a fine navigable freeway and saw a century of river traffic in the form of canoes, rafts, and York boats, which later gave way to paddle wheelers and barges. While Fort Edmonton and like posts in the north were developing into thriving communities, embracing the agriculture industry little by little, and attracting some permanent settlers, settlers, incidentally, that were the forefathers of the pioneers that we're soon going to see on our giant stage. Little, if any, development was taking place in the South. However, it's time to turn our attention to the South. Now, when you look down here, you'll probably view that vast area as just so much waste. And also, you'll recognize an aversion to settling there because this is the home of the much-feared Blackfoot Indian. But if you watch as the 1860s and 1870s unfold, you're going to see a huge cast of American free traders come onto the scene. They're known as wolfers and whiskey traders, and they're going to set up little posts all over Blackfoot territory. Generally, their deportment's going to be questionable, and in short order, reports are going to the Canadian government of drunken, bloodletting brawls. It was a dark period, but a colorful one in Alberta history. These whiskey posts, such as Fort Whoop Up, run by Hamilton and Healy, traded first-class buffalo hides for knives, blankets, guns, and a pint of brew that literally fried an Indian's mind. Fort Poop Up was the kingpin of them all, but there were others. Spitzy Post, Fort's Standoff and Slide Out, Robber's Roost and Whiskey Gap. And they were established by colorful personalities too, 
like Liver Eating Johnson and Dave Akers and Charles Thomas and Moses Solomon. The Whoop Up Trail from Fort Benton, Montana to Southern Alberta became a well-traveled route as trade goods and barrels of whiskey traveled one way and wolf pelts and buffalo hides went the other. The reign of the whiskey posts was a short one. It was only three seasons, but it was long enough to cause terrible poverty and grief on the once proud Blackfoot nation. Besides the demoralization caused by the whiskey, the buffalo slaughter resulted in near starvation for the natives. The crackle of gunfire from the whoop up trail was not unknown or even rare. The whiskey traders were for the most part evil men, arrogant, cruel, and unfair. Finally, they overplayed their hand. It happened way east in the Cypress Hills. Some Plains Cree, full of rot gut booze, booze they got from the traders, set out on a horse stealing expedition. The intention was to go south to the Blackfoot Territory and raid their hated rivals. They didn't make it that far. They came upon a camp of American traders and they soon decided the horse corral of the white man would provide as good a ponies as would the Blackfoot encampment, and these were closer. Well, in the morning the Americans woke, and they soon had revenge on their mind. They set out 16 strong with lever action rifles determined to teach the horse stealing Indians a lesson and also to get back their horses. They lost the trail of the Cree somewhere in the Cypress Hills, but by now they were not so bent on recovery as they were on revenge. Near where Fort Walsh now stands, just over the Saskatchewan border, they came upon a camp of innocent Assiniboine Indians. After sizing up the situation, they surrounded the camp, and in a callous, senseless massacre, they opened fire, killing 20 Indians. Well, that was the beginning of the end for the whiskey trader. The news of the atrocity soon reached the ears of the lawmakers in Ottawa. They had procrastinated for years on the fashioning of a police force for the lawless West, but this was too much. Within days, Parliament set up the machinery for the force that was to be known as the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. In fact, at the time, it was the Northwest Mounted Police. And in a year's time, they were recruited and headed west on one of the most famous police actions of all time. Now, if you look to the east, you'll see them coming. Green and saddle sore. They make up quite a parade nonetheless. Scarlet tunic, white helmets, oxen carts for provisions, livestock, ammunition wagons, and some 350 men. For most, their very first taste of the wide open spaces. That they were able to come through that torturous ride at all is remarkable. That they did it and still presented a formidable law enforcement body on arrival is even today one of their proudest accomplishments. The whiskey trader was finished. Even the arrival of 4,000 Sioux fresh from the Custer Massacre didn't seem to phase these courageous young men. The forerunners of our present Royal Canadian Mounted Police were without doubt an example of self-discipline, devotion to duty and country, an example of courage that is rarely found singly and hardly ever displayed by an entire group. The first of the Redcoats received some valuable help from a famous Alberta Métis character named Jerry Potts. Without him, the whole brigade would have certainly had even more difficulties than they had already experienced. Well, they didn't know how to find celebrated Fort Whoop Up. They had to have an interpreter to communicate with the Indians. And in Jerry Potts, they had both guide and interpreter. Finally reaching Fort Whoop Up, they found that the news of their coming had preceded their arrival and the worst of the lawless traders had hightailed it for the border. Jerry Potts took them on north to the shores of the Old Man River where the force set up the first western police post of historic Fort McLeod. It wasn't long after that that a detachment under Inspector Brisbois traveled north to the confluence of the Bow and Elbow Rivers and established a second fort. It started out as Fort Brisbois, 
but it soon became Fort Calgary. Named by either Colonel McLeod or Assistant Commissioner Irvin, both of whom were intensely Scottish. There seems to be a dispute as to which of the two actually did rename the tiny post. Well, the Mounties had little time to get used to their new home. Among their very first visitors at Fort McLeod was Chief Crowfoot, undoubtedly the most powerful and respected chief in the Blackfoot Brotherhood. It was fortunate that Colonel McLeod was able to favorably impress the wise chieftain as to their purpose, and Crowfoot was to become an important ally. The alliance between Redcoat and Chief Crowfoot reached its peak when on an historic date of September 22, 1877, on a beautiful knoll looking down on the Bow River, the official signing of the historic Treaty No. 7 took place. It signaled the end of open hostility between the warlike Blackfoot and their Plains brothers, the Blood, Pagan, Sarsi, and Stony tribes, and the incoming Whites. The law had not only come west, its main purpose had already been accomplished. The early day Northwest Mounted Police made many contributions that are not normally credited to them. They did some farming, they delivered the mail for a time, and they were a great aid in the arrival of the railway on the prairies. When news of the arrival of the law on these untamed prairies reached the outside world, there was new interest in Great Britain and many countries in Europe. Land starved and anxious for the right to farm their own land, many a European family began packing for the faraway Northwest Territories. The more adventurous husbands were already on their way and many with little more than a pack on their back to lay claim to a quarter section of their own. Some packed a handful of seed with them and they guarded that seed packet as closely as they did their money purse. It's often true that to be the very first into anything is not the best. Well, certainly these earliest of the new settlers found that. Pioneering is only for the very tough. But the trickle of new blood, new cultures, and new ideas was underway. In only a few short years, the rolling Atlantic Ocean would be highway for thousands of seasick adventurers on their way to the Promised Land. It's good that the sea captains, once started, would not turn back, or else many a wretched passenger would never have made Canada. But in the end they did, and that's where a new chapter begins in Our Alberta. <laughs>